Hello and welcome to today's lecture on neuromuscular conditions with a focus on muscular dystrophy. My name is Kendra Ganyan. I am a pediatric physical therapist and a professor of physical therapy. After you finish today's lecture, you should be able to describe how Duchenne muscular dystrophy is defined and diagnosed. Identify common impairments, activity limitations, and participation restrictions associated with Duchenne muscular dystrophy and describe basic principles of physical therapy management of Duchenne muscular dystrophy for children in infancy, preschool, school age, and adolescence through adulthood. So you may encounter many different children with neuromuscular disorders, and today we're going to focus in on Duchenne muscular dystrophy because it is one of the most common types of neuromuscular disorders that you may encounter in pediatric practice. And it's also the most common form of muscular dystrophy. So there are many forms of muscular dystrophy besides Duchenne, but this is the most common. So Duchenne muscular dystrophy is an X-linked disorder. So it's a sex-linked genetic condition that is, uh, because of that, almost exclusively found in boys. It occurs in one out of every 3,500 live male births, and it's due to a missing or defective gene that is responsible for the production of dystrophin, which is a structural muscle protein. And what happens is without that production of dystrophin, um, boys with muscular dystrophy experience progressive muscle cell destruction. And diagnosis of muscular dystrophy, oftentimes children are uh, initially sort of um, flagged by individuals who are working with them, often physical therapists, because of some of the movements or even some loss of function that they're seeing. But there actually is um, clinical diagnostic tests um, in addition to that clinical presentation, which include lab studies as well as EMG. So this is just a figure that sort of gives you a sense of what occurs um, on the cellular level with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So you can see here, um, Here's dystrophin right here, and I'm not going to get into um, the details of this slide, but basically what you can see is this is a muscle cell, and dystrophin obviously is a very large part of the cell that really holds a lot of those pieces together, and I think you can appreciate that here. To the right, we have a um, kind of cross-section of muscle fibers, and so here on the left we see what's kind of quote-unquote typical cross-section of muscle fibers. And so you'll notice that the muscle fibers are all, um, they're tightly packed, they're um, very similar size and shape, um, very uniform. Here on the right, you can see the cross-section of muscle fibers for a boy with muscular dystrophy. By contrast, you can see the muscle fibers are all different shapes and sizes. There's lots of kind of fatty tissue and connective tissue in between. They're not tightly packed. And so without that production of dystrophin, this is really sort of what you get shoulders and arms to be retracted in that way. So here we see a kind of a typical posture in a, this figure of a boy with muscular dystrophy. So I want to point out a few things here in terms of the common impairments we see in children with muscular dystrophy. First of all, kind of back to that discussion we just had, muscle weakness, which often looks like uh, pseudo hypertrophy. So again, you can see here on this figure, these thick lower leg muscles which look like big, strong muscles, but are actually mostly fat and not strong at all, really quite weak. And so we see um, boys with muscular dystrophies tend to be toe walkers. They have that tight heel cord, so the contracture of the gastroxoleus usually is one of the first to tighten up, but there's a lot of weakness there as well. Also, weak muscles on the front of the leg cause some, cause some foot drop and kind of contribute to that contracture. We also have tightening of the TFL, often and um, weakness in the gluteal muscles as well as abdominals and the upper body. So you'll see a posture that's really characterized by um, lordosis, um, kind of this protruding belly, some scapular winging where the shoulders and arms are held kind of back and retracted. So this is kind of boys trying to artificially kind of stabilize and oftentimes you'll see some scoliosis as well. So this is just a really typical presentation you'll see um, in a boy with muscular dystrophy. So again, when we look back at the early signs of muscular dystrophy, um, again, we know this is a genetic condition that children are born with, but often it isn't 
noted until they're older, unless, of course, there's some sort of family history or reason that the family may um, have to believe that the child should be tested. So in infancy to preschool, often there's no impairment, activity limitations, or participation restrictions. There are a subset of boys with muscular dystrophy who do show some of those signs we talked about earlier. Um, you know, they may be as two and three and four year olds a little bit clumsy. They may walk a little bit later. But there's actually a good um, proportion of children with muscular dystrophy that, that show absolutely no signs at all in those early years. About half of boys with muscular dystrophy don't walk until they're 18 months old, but this usually doesn't lead to a diagnosis. There are lots of kids who don't walk until they're 18 months old, and there may be lots of reasons for that. Um, they're, the most common one is just that they're a late walker. So most, the vast majority of children who don't walk until they're 15 to 18 months old um, are perfectly typically developing. They just happen to be on the really, really late side and that remember that less than 10% who walk after 15 months. Um, then there are other reasons as well. You know, you could be looking at something like cerebral palsy or other genetic conditions. So again, not a walking late, it's not typically going to cause anyone to be concerned about muscular dystrophy because that is a sign that you might remember looking backward but is certainly nothing that's um, going to be an, in, an indicator of muscular dystrophy. So that's why that doesn't usually lead to a diagnosis. Usually kids aren't diagnosed until approximately five years old. And so what happens kind of at that age of diagnosis? Why, why do we get there? Well, first of all, again, at about five years old, often we see, and again, there's a range for this depending on the individual child, and um, there also is a range of severity of muscular dystrophy depending on whether um, that gene is completely missing or part of it is missing. Um, so you may see clumsiness. So again, these are kiddos who may just kind of trip and fall and be a little bit clumsy. You're gonna notice an inability to keep up with peers. So again, they're just gonna seem a little slower and more behind. And even if that is noticed looking backwards at age one or two, it's probably not going to interfere with keeping up with peers until they hit kind of that school age when life becomes more demanding and their friends are getting bigger, stronger, faster, and they're really not. And so that's when that kind of gap becomes apparent. You also might notice that gait pattern, that lateral trunk sway or that typical waddling gait. So again, remember there's kind of all that weakness around the hip and abdominals and the tightening of the TFL. And so boys with muscular dystrophy have a real characteristic kind of waddling gait. And you might start to notice that they really sway their trunk and kind of hip hike as they walk. And then, of course, Gower sign. And I've got a slide here in a moment that's going to show you sort of what that looks like. But Gower sign is one that's um, a hallmark of muscular dystrophy. And often, um, I can just say anecdotally in practice, that's one of the ones that I see the most common is, you know, physical therapists maybe or physical therapist assistants may be working with children who um, are experiencing delays. They may not have any other diagnosis and then they'll see the Gower sign and then they may be the ones that then trigger a discussion with the physician and further testing on this. So Gower sign is a big one. So within a few years after diagnosis, we really start to see the, um, the weakness, that progressive weakness really start to kick in. So kids with muscular dystrophy then have difficulty with stair climbing. Again, getting up from the floor um, becomes more difficult. Toe walking, um, a compensated Trendelenburg gait, fatigue. And then there may also be some pulmonary impairment that begins to um, appear in that age group. So this is an image of a Gower sign. I've got a link here to a YouTube video as well if you want to look at that. Or it's really quite easy to find. You can search, you know, Gower sign online and find lots of videos. Um, but really you see here's a boy with muscular dystrophy getting up from the floor. And you can notice that the Gower sign is really um, characterized by this, you know, instead of just standing up from the floor, you know, usually through a kneeling or a half kneeling position like we typically do, boys with muscular dystrophy will come to this kind of plantigrade bear walk position and then they'll rise from that position and often as they do they kind of use their hands to push up on their legs because that lower body is is quite weak and so they're sort of compensating for that so when you see that um, sign 
that is, again, a real hallmark of muscular dystrophy and something that should definitely raise a red flag and warrant a conversation. And again, I encourage you um, when you finish this presentation to go kind of check out some videos online so you can see that Gower sign in action. So primary concerns when we are working with boys with muscular dystrophy, um, obviously the weakness is an issue, but that's not something that we're necessarily going to be able to um, address. The, the progressive weakness is part of the genetic condition. We can't, there's no cure for the genetic condition. So um, we certainly may work on some strengthening. We have to be careful not to um, overstress. So there's a lot of, um, there's been a lot of literature and discussion in the past about, and there's kind of still some myths out there that it's not safe to strengthen boys with muscular dystrophy. And that's untrue. You probably don't want to go to max contractions, but definitely doing some um, kind of general strengthening can help kind of mitigate the effects of that um, muscular deterioration and maybe maintain strength for a little bit longer. Um, addressing range of motion concerns is definitely an issue. Um, we may work on just some range of motion and also splinting, night splinting. Ambulation dysfunction, so again, that gait pattern, so which then can become an issue of safety, you know, falls, tripping because of the foot drop. So we may be looking at some, you know, orthotic interventions and things like that. Um, obviously, decrease in functional ability occurs over time. Decreased pulmonary function is a huge concern because this actually is what's something that becomes really dangerous for boys with muscular dystrophy later. Um, the emotional trauma, it is um, devastating to have a condition that is incurable and that will shorten your life. And so we can't um, kind of underestimate the needs of the family and the child themselves in you know, kind of getting help and support with kind of the emotional piece of this. Progressive scoliosis can also be a concern in this condition, as well as pain. So in terms of interventions, um, medical interventions, there are, again, there's no cure for muscular dystrophy. Um, medicine is moving rapidly. There's probably new treatments that have, are being created right now um, that aren't reflected in this, in this presentation. But in general, um, steroids and oral creatine can help keep boys with uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy stronger longer. Again, there's no cure. There's no way to prevent the decline, and there's no way to get back muscle function once it's been lost. So what we're really trying to do is just sort of slow and delay that muscle weakening. Orthopedically, um, we may need to be looking at interventions for scoliosis, um, the gastroc contracture, so stretching as well as splinting, putting, you know, boys with Duchenne muscular dystrophy will often wear night splints to kind of keep that gastroc in a, in a lengthened position. We also need to make sure that we're really maintaining weight bearing um, and doing what we need to do to keep that bone density up because the boys with muscular dystrophy can be at risk for stress fractures. In terms of pulmonary concerns, again, this is a huge one because this is what actually becomes really dangerous for boys later um, in early adulthood. But we really want to make sure that we're keeping, again, um, we're working on ventilation, airway clearance, um, kind of trying to keep those um, muscles of respiration um, strong and kind of working on that piece. In terms of cardiac, boys with muscular dystrophy tend to get regular cardiac monitoring and may experience arrhythmia, so they may be on medications for that. And then in GI issues, um, weight gain is a very big concern for boys with muscular dystrophy, so there may be some issues there that we need to deal with as physical therapists. Um, constipation and feeding, all of those things can be problematic. So I kind of touched on these in the previous slide, but again, just to reiterate, um, preventing that lower extremity to deformity, we're going to work on range of motion, orthotics, casting, and splinting are all very common interventions. Um, we want to make sure that we're really um, looking at seating. So um, usually wheelchair seating is, it's, it's, um, going to be inevitable for these boys that they're eventually going to get into a wheelchair. And so when that happens, we may be looking at seating, making sure that they're, you know, seated properly, that they're properly supported. And so we're um, kind of, again, mitigating that, uh, that um, tendency towards a scoliosis. 
And in severe situations, surgery may be indicated, but then usually families get into that discussion, depending on the age of the boy, whether surgery is worth it when you have a progressive in, um, illness that is going to result in early death. You know, do you go through surgery or do you kind of just live with and manage this issue? And so that becomes some of the conversations and really challenging conversations with boys with muscular dystrophy and their families. Aerobic exercise is safe and it's necessary. We just have to make sure to avoid overuse. So um, just making sure that we're not exercising these boys to the point of post-exercise soreness, cramping, weakness, and being very careful about eccentric exercises to avoid really overtaxing those muscles. So that aerobic exercise is critically important for health, but the role of, of us as physical therapists and physical therapist assistants is to help guide and make sure that we're not overdoing it and that we're um, getting that just right challenge. Similarly with resistive exercises, that has been controversial in the past, and I mentioned this before, but there are um, is definitely new research and literature that shows that resistive exercises um, can be incredibly effective in helping to keep boys stronger longer. And so there's not any reason we should avoid some um, resistive exercises, but we should avoid maximal resistive training as well as eccentric exercise. So again, our role is to kind of come up with that um, sort of light resistive exercise training that um, continues to kind of help keep up strength without, uh, without damaging the muscles. And then of course, again, as I said, you know, wheelchair seating is an inevitable outcome in Bichon muscular dystrophy. It's not a matter of if, it's when. And so the earlier the, or the longer we can keep boys ambulating, the less likely they are going to be to have those issues like um, low bone density and stress fractures and um, obesity and those cardiopulmonary kind of issues because, you know, we can keep them upright and moving. So we do definitely want to prolong ambulation as much as we can. Oftentimes that's done through um, use of orthotics. So we use orthotics to provide some um, foot ankle support, um, a standing program. So we may have boys with muscular dystrophy, dystrophy may get to a point where we have actually standers that they will stand in. And again, that may just help keep them upright and may also help with the bone density and GI issues even after they're not able to ambulate much any longer. We can still continue with standing programs. And there may be um, indications for surgeries for tendon lengthening, you know, whatever is needed to kind of keep that ambulation going as long as possible. And not only is the prolonging ambulation good for, you know, again, GI and muscle or bone density and all of those things, but it's typically a goal of the child and family to be able to continue to walk as long as possible. Now that said, um, wheelchair use is inevitable. And so again, in, as physical therapists and physical therapist assistants, our job is to really help families kind of figure out how to make that transition. And so while prolonging ambulation is necessary, there also becomes a point when focusing on walking alone is going to, the trade-off is going to be a, a extreme fatigue um, maybe being late to class, being unable to participate with friends because they're always behind. It takes them so long. And so we definitely want to prolong ambulation, but that may be in the context of exercise, not functional mobility. Um, do not wait to introduce wheeled mobility as functional mobility and do not wait to introduce power mobility if necessary because Again, we're talking about quality of life as well and not being able to keep up with friends, not being able to go out in the community, um, not being able to get to class on time. All of those things are, are very problematic for kind of social, the social piece of life. And so um, helping families navigate wheelchair use, helping them transition to power mobility, um, and really just making sure that their environments are accessible for those wheelchairs is really important. Again, I mentioned weight control can be an issue. Uh, respiratory is going to de definitely be a huge issue, so we want to really be on top of that. We may be helping with interventions of, for ADLs, including sleep. And again, just providing that family support because this is a very challenging, devastating, long process and um, can be you know, very challenging for the family.
So in the adolescent period, we typically see a significant progression of disability. And that's important to know because if we're working with a child in the pre-adolescent period and we start looking at, say, wheelchairs and their insurance will pay for one wheelchair every five years, for example, we know that that could go really, that, that progression of disability happens very quickly in adolescence. And so we may start talking about power mobility before they really um, necessarily need it because we know what's coming. And so it's really important for us to kind of be able to kind of um, understand the course of muscular dystrophy and also have those conversations with families. So pr disability progresses quickly in adolescence. Um, muscle weakness and contractures continue. This is when difficulties with ADLs tend to really pop up, which is really challenging socially and emotionally because this is just at the point in time when um, typically an adolescent wants to be really independent with those ADLs, right? Um, surgical interventions may be indicated to try to help prevent some of these secondary impairments and, um, and kind of prolong ambulation and all of those pieces. And this is usually when the cessation of standing and walking occurs. And again, we want to prolong ambulation as much as possible, but we, can't, we have to make sure that we're not doing so at the expense of function and quality of life. And so that's kind of that challenge of us in physical therapy with this population is, you know, kind of helping families and boys with muscular dystrophy make the transition from when walking is really functional and possible to now I use a wheelchair for functional mobility, but I still do some walking and standing kind of therapeutically and for exercise and then even transitioning to power and kind of, um, kind of managing that process and kind of helping families understand the um, kind of benefits and challenges associated with, with all of it. Transition to adulthood is, again, another really big challenge for men with muscular dystrophy and their families. Um, you have continued progression of the disability. By adulthood, almost all men with muscular dystrophy are going to be um, dependent on power mobility and require assistance for ADLs, oftentimes needing lifts for transfers because they've become more dependent but also larger. And then skin integrity starts to become an issue. Um, even for kids who lose some mobility earlier, um, you know, kids' skin is, is pretty resilient. And so you just don't see as many issues with kind of pressure ulcers and things with kids. But as we transition to adulthood, our, our skin becomes a little bit less elastic. It heals a little bit slower. And so skin integrity can be, start to become an issue at this age and this time. And really a big focus becomes on respiratory considerations because respiratory issues are a contributor in death in the majority of cases of muscular dystrophy. So this is a time when we really may start to focus on breathing exercises, postural drainage, um, using a power controlled bed to elevate the head of the bed and kind of some of that positioning and mechanical ventilation um, often becomes a part of this, these men's lives. And so then in the terminal stage, um, respiratory insufficiency, restriction of chest wall excursion, um, oxygen desaturation coma is kind of the course that often comes and leads to um, death. Death for men with muscular dystrophy may, incur, may occur in the teens or 20s, but medical advances have led to men living into their 30s and 40s now. So again, we haven't cured muscular dystrophy, but have definitely found medical interventions and approaches that have led to longer lives and better quality of lives. So you're gonna see a lot more men with Duchenne muscular dystrophy living longer. And again, um, remember Duchenne muscular dystrophy is just one type of muscular dystrophy. There are many types, some of which may have a um, milder course, so and others that may be more severe. So this is just one example that I presented to you today. And so that is all I have for today. I want to thank you for listening and I will see you next time.